The basis for this video revolves around the concept of a freehold, essentially in the name, something that is held freely. Of course, there's a little bit more to it, and usually the freehold tends to apply to what we today would call an estate. According to the Oxford Languages Dictionary, anyway, freehold uh, derived from the word free and hold is a noun. Permanent and absolute tenure, tenure of course meaning holding, of land or property with freedom to dispose of it at will, often contrasted with leasehold. Of course, some might understand that a lease does not have to apply to only land or property, but nowadays is usually a term used only in relation to land or property, like you could lease a boat, for instance, versus having the free hold of a boat. So the content of this video revolves around who the freeholder is who actually tangibly has a free hold, a unobstructed tenure, holding something freely, of which most of us today no longer have what we would consider a free hold. None of us freely hold, well, mostly we don't freely hold anything. So it all comes down to the perspective of who the actual freeholder is and how that freehold is essentially speaking retained. To start with, we can uh, get an idea in the context of this video what the situation was like in so-called colonial America, but at least the America of the 17th and 18th centuries. We will find some pretty stark or very strong similarities to the regime that we live under today. And now this book that we get our example from, it's called Trade and Empire, the British Customs Service in Colonial America, 1660 to 1775, Thomas C. Barrow, 1967, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Copyright 1967 by the President and Fellows of Harvard College, all rights reserved. Distributed in Great Britain by Oxford University Press, London. Library of Congress, catalog number, blah, blah, blah. Printed in the United States of America. Here on page 26, it states, The absent governor who finally arrived in Virginia in the middle of these events was forcibly prevented from entering the settlement at Albemarle by the rebels and died in Virginia shortly thereafter. Miller himself, along with his surveyor, escaped eventually to England. There he had Culpepper, who had gone to London to present the rebel story to the proprietors, arrested, charging him and Gilliam with overthrow of the lawful authority in Carolina. In this case, much depended on the attitude of the Lord proprietors. First, they seemed inclined to support Miller in a lukewarm fashion. Miller did have full and ample powers from East Church, but he did many extravagant things alienating the people. On the other hand, the proprietors said, Gilliam, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce that, was involved in the rebellion, and the other leader, Culpepper, was a very ill man having some time before fled from South Carolina, where he was in danger of hanging for laying the designs and endeavoring to set the poor people to plunder the rich. So, of course, my question would be, what does that sound like that we're going through today? The commissioners of the customs were quite explicit as to their position. They recommended that Miller and the other officers be restored to their employment and estates and be fully repaired for any damages done them. In their opinion, it should be made highly penal for the future to oppose such collections and collectors and the governor and all in authority should be enjoined to give all countenance and assistance thereunto. So here you get an idea of the original worst of, uh, use of the word penal or penalty versus, of course, the other euphemism for the word penal. Next, on page 249, skipping, of course, through the, the book because we're trying to get an idea of what the situation was actually like at the time and how it reflects the situation of today under the heading Collapse. By 1773, the East India Company was in financial distress. 
Imports from India rotted in its warehouse while its stocks dropped continually in value. New markets were needed and quickly or the company, the 400,000 a year uh, pound sterling, which the government received from it as well as the British possessions in India would be endangered. North's solution was to rescue the company provi by providing it with new markets in America. When the company director suggested to him that the tax on tea imported into America should be repealed, the Prime Minister declined to take that step. Instead, he allowed the company to export its tea directly to America without being required as formally to auction it off to English middlemen who in turn sent it on to the colonies. At the same time, the government surrendered for the moment the 400000 a year pound sterling the yearly payment the company had made and also gave the company an emergency loan of £1,400,000 sterling. North clung to the tea duty in the colonies, not only because he had made it a symbol of parliamentary supremacy, but also because he was intrigued by the thought of the potential increase in the revenues available to the English government in America. If the East India Company will export tea to America, they will very much increase their, that duty and consequently very much facilitate the carrying of government in that part. In fact, North's plan was subtly designed to promote the consumption of tea in America to the benefit both of the company and of the royal revenues. But North overestimated the naivete of the colonists. Not only was the duty on tea the one remaining tax left from the hated Townsend program, but the entrance of the East India Company into the local markets upset the established patterns of the tea trade, alienating elements of the commercial classes in all the colonial ports. Not the least affected were those who had profited from the smuggling of tea, long a traditional pastime of the Americans, for Americans. The destruction of the tea sent to America, highlighted by the party at Boston, brought a sudden end to the period of watchful waiting. Even had he wished, North could not overlook this insult to the authority of Parliament. To have done so would have been political suicide. Even Pitt proclaimed the action of the Boston radicals as criminal, and popular opinion swung firmly behind a policy of retaliatory measures. The result was the enactment of the coercive acts and the beginning of the end for England's rule in America. So too began the last humiliating episode in the long history of the Colonial Customs Service. For the customs commissioners themselves, the Boston Port Act was at first a repetition of their early experiences in the aftermath of the Liberty Seizure and the Massacre. They fled to the shelter of the harbor port, reporting to the treasury that, as usual, they were special object of the people's rage. From November 30th to the end of December, they were confined to the port. At the end of December, they ventured out to form a meeting in Boston, but confessed frankly to the treasury lords that they did not expect to be there long. The commissioners were back in Boston from December 30th, 17, 1773, until June 1774. Then they retreated to Salem. To the very end, the English authorities displayed a fascinating respect for the letter of the law. With the closing of Boston and the transfer of all cargoes formerly destined for that port to Salem, that city became the most active port in Massachusetts. Since it was enacted that none of the necessary supplies could be entered into Boston except via the port of Salem, which included Mar Marblehead. The customs officer formerly stationed in Boston could have been put to good use there. Unfortunately, Salem was not legally included in the port to Boston. So the Boston officers went instead to Plymouth, which was legally part of the Boston district, where they sat idly by with hardly a ship entering the minor port, while the undermanned staff in Salem and Marblehead struggled with the increased traffic. Step by step, the open conflict between England and the colonies was drawing closer. During these hectic months, the major concern of the Customs Service was to prevent the importation of supplies of war into the colonies. Dutch gunpowder being the greatest item in this trade, when warned to prevent such goods from reaching the colonists, the collector and comptroller in Rhode Island answered that they would do their best, but that the inhabitants had already purchased 300 barrels of Dutch powder and some field pieces as well. They thought the goods were brought from St. Eustatia. Reports from other colonies told much the same story. Aside from the warning their officers to watch for such shipments and to carry their work at best they might, the commissioners devoted the major energies to the legal problems created by the closing of Boston. From their retreat in Salem, they directed the flow of foodstuffs and supplies into Boston. At times, their insistence on observing the letter of the law irritated the military officers attempting to implement the blockade of Boston. But by the middle of September 1774, 
In spite of Parliament's order that no customs officers should be in Boston, the commissioners and most of other customs officers had to flee Salem to take refuge with the army in that city. The countryside was in an uproar, and no member of the despised service was safe beyond the immediate protection of the military. Following the enactment of the Boston Port Act, Parliament passed further retaliatory measures. The Massachusetts Government Act, May 20, 1774, brought an end to charter government in that colony. The Quartering Act permitted this forceful courting of English troops where necessary, wherever necessary. The British were preparing for war, nor were the colonists far behind. The First Continental Congress presented a united colonial front assembled in Philadelphia on September 5, 1774. In April of the next year, the first clash between the royal forces and the colonists occurred at Lexington and Concord. The empty authority of the Customs Commissioners lingered on into the fall of 1775. <clears throat> By November of that year, Admiral Thomas Graves, commander of the fleet, belatedly informed them that as far as he was concerned, their authority had ended with the declaration of martial law. The commissioners asked the advice of the Treasury, but hardly needed to wait for a reply. All over the colonies, the English administration had been thrown off with little ceremony. The battle at Lexington and Concord, followed by the fight at Bunker Hill, ended whatever hope the conservatives in America had of obtaining peaceful settlement of the disputes. Both sides were stirred by the news of the open combats. Symptomatic of the seriousness of the breach was the news from New Hampshire. Governor John Wentworth there had always managed to maintain friendly relations with the inhabitants and was himself a popular and respected figure. On May 18, 1775, the collector and comptroller of Piscataqua, or Piscataqua informed the board that they had, of necessity, taken refuge on a man of war in the harbor. The governor had not yet left the province, but was fortified in his house and preparing for a siege. If Wentworth in New Hampshire could not maintain his authority, there was little hope that any other royal governor could do so. By November 1775, the Comptroller of Philadelphia was in London reporting the events had put it out of my power of staying in America. Francis Waldo, the collector at Falmouth in Maine, and a native of that place was forced to follow the Philadelphia officers shortly thereafter. One after the other, the customs officers fled from their posts to safety under the protection of the British Army or to England. When early in 1776 the British were forced to evacuate Boston, the commissioners themselves left the colonies, recognizing that, whatever the eventual outcome for the next few years at least, there was little that they could do in America. The commissioners were moved first to Halifax. There they discharged all the incidental officers, carried on the salary lists, and embarked for England. The departure of the American commissioners signaled the end of the Colonial Customs Service. Officially, the American establishment lingered on until 1783 when the commissioners and the other officers were finally dismissed. Until that time, such as had not been provided with other positions in the English service continued to receive their salaries. Not until the final peace treaty was signed in American independence, a recognized fact, was all hope abandoned and the 110-year history of the Colonial Service brought to a close. Five more years were required before Charles Stewart managed to complete his accounts of the finances of the American establishment. But in 1789, when the Treasury approved his reports and discharged him from any further responsibilities, the last official action regarding the Colonial Customs Service had been taken. The great experiment had been, which had commenced in 1673, was finished. That's page 252. Now, of course, as we know today, this same situation is what we're facing now. That's because the Constitutional United States or the Constitutional States of America, CSA, which we incorrectly call the Confederate States of America, ended during the, or, or a little bit after anyway, the Civil War period, but there were a lot of remnants, of course, to deal with and still are today. So what, in fact, we're facing today is a second war for independence from the very same people that set this stuff up in the first place. And that's the reason why the events that we're, we're seeing today unfolding, such as the uh, instigation of the poor to uh, rob the rich, as it's stated before, the upheaval and continuous combat with the phony corporate governments, the essentially speaking charter governments of municipal corporations, and all of the other essentially service members, such as with the Internal Revenue Service and technically speaking customs, um, the same thing that the customs service was or the commissioners and all that stuff. Well, we're facing the same thing today because they reinstituted the exact same scheme. So, there's a problem here, of course, is that when they get kicked out of the 
constitutional states of America, that's of course being the globalists, the cabal, internationalists, whatever you want to call them, essentially speaking, people that were behind the colonial system to begin with, well, they had a problem, which is that it, there's an embedded resentment towards these particular systems and these particular names. So not only did they have to remove the element of the constitutional states of America causing problems for them across the globe, but they also had to essentially flip the narrative. Take what the colonists did in the time period and take those actions and make them hated and then flip the script and make it fact the British Customs Service, as well as the Board of Trade, the Lord Proprietors, and all of the other elements that were involved in the uh, heinous acts that caused the War for Independence to begin with, well, they had to essentially make them into heroes and the colonists not only into villains, but they also had to erase the names of the heroes from that time period, such as a particular individual called uh, Collector Barons and all of the other rebellions that happened, and all the contrasts to what's going on today. So there was not just the replacing of the organizational structure of the constitutional states of America, which was a problem for the globalist internationalists that run things today, but they also had to essentially replace the perspective towards the constitutional states of America. The primary method that they used for this replacement, we can call it maybe the Great Replacement, is the idea of spinning a story, some might also say spinning a yarn. The definition from the Free Dictionary by Farlex is to spin one a story is to tell a lie or only part of the truth in order to convince one of something or to avoid the consequences of something. That is a pretty accurate definition and that's exactly what they had to do and did. Now we can get an idea of a modern example, relatively speaking, of how the story gets spun. This is from Wikipedia, the Myanmar Civil War, also known as the Burmese Civil War, Burmese Spring Revolution, or People's Defensive War. Well, there you go with the first, the first element are a bunch of labels that they're throwing at it. Is an ongoing civil war, there's another label, following Myanmar's long-running insurgencies, another label which escalated significantly in response to the 2021 military coup d'etat. Another label. Military, of course, uh, being the English-sized version of the French, military. Of course, they would use a different uh, la force, for instance, would be the French they would use, or la force from Spanish. Uh, coup d'etat, of course, is a strike of the state, and that has many different significations that are not used because the definition of the word's been changed. Now it's just basically a label to mean something that doesn't apply to the original French. And the subsequent violent crackdown on anti-coup protests. And another label. The exiled National Unity Government. There's another label. And major ethnic armed organization was repudiated the 2008 Constitution and called instead for a democratic federal state. Besides engaging this alliance, the ruling government of the State Administration Council, or SAC, also contends with other anti-SAC forces in, is in area un areas under its control. Hannah Beach of the New York Times observed the insurgents are apportioned in hundreds of armed groups scattered across the country. Okay, so from reading that, the only thing that we can really gain from it is there's some sort of conflict going on in the area. But, in addition, there may be nothing going on there. And you can't really know unless you're there. But naturally, if you're told that there's a violent conflict there, that would dissuade people from even traveling to the region to confirm the fact of whether or not there is, in fact, any conflict going on at all. And that is what it means by spinning a story. One way or another, they're lying. And this is the same tactic that they use across the board Whenever there's a situation, they will spin a story, and this is well known as a tactic in politics, that when something happens that is uh, in opposition to you or a problem, well, you spin a story, and essentially speaking, create an elaborate lie to subvert the truth of 
or to avoid, as I said before, the consequences of a particular action or event. Now, the next thing that they had to do, other than spinning the story, is to actually subvert the tangible idea of a market. Like we read before, th when they imposed the East India Company into already established local markets, it created upheaval. And so what they want to do to avoid that happening again is they want to remove the market, the tangible market, of actually engaging in what is truly marketing from the hands of the regular individuals, and they do this through the stock market scheme. The stock market, according to Wikipedia, equity market or share market is the aggregation of buyers and sellers of stocks, also called shares, which represent ownership claims on businesses. This may include securities listed on a public stock exchange, as well as stocks that is only traded privately, such as shares of private companies that are sold to investors through equity crowdfunding platforms. Investments are usually made with an investment strategy in mind. So essentially, the, the idea behind this is to remove the idea of an individual going and, say, trading uh, different objects of value like uh, oil, uh, minerals, uh, gold, fruit, food, uh, clothing, things like that, right? To, to remove that from the hands of the regular person so that something like the war for independence can't happen again. But, of course, they can't just remove it. They have to replace it with something, and that's where this idea of the stock market comes from, which is, essentially speaking, many layers of middlemen, and that most trading just happens in theory and not in actuality. Like, you do not go to the stock market, and you do not actually trade anything of tangible value. You trade hypothetical ownership of a hypothetical company, which is not actually based on the tangible as aspect of business, which is that, it doesn't matter what you have on paper. A business is a business if you're actually in business, whereas we have many paper businesses on paper that don't actually do anything. Now, there's a video game called Sea of Thieves in which they have a, as far as I can tell, the only example of what relates to this topic today. Now, the original constitutional states of America, they were a merchant republic meaning most of their trade and most of the things they did was based off the sea, and their control was based off of access to the inland trade with the American Indian nations. And that's a big deal. So in Sea of Thieves, they have these things called emissary flags, and it states here, what are emissary flags in Sea of Thieves? Emissary flags are special flags in Sea of Thieves that are hoisted to indicate a crew status as a trading company's representative emissary. So whenever any ship today, even if it's a regular private sailing vessel, whenever they pull into port, they are required, essentially speaking, hoist an emissary flag. That is what the flag of, say, Denmark, the United States, or any of these other UN nation juridic entities are. They're corporations. And therefore, whenever they put the flags on, they're forced to essentially become an emissary of that corporate company, being the fake government. And they're forced to fly under that flag, showing that they are an emissary of it. Now, this, of course, negates the original idea of what emissary flags were, showing that you had a special contract and thus the protection of that entity that you were flying the flag for. It's not the case today. You do not have the protection of the flags of the entity whose flags you are forced to fly. You are forced to fly those flags in order to pull into their corporate port. And that's the big difference. Can't pull into their corporate port if you don't fly their flag because you're not a member of their company. Next, of course, comes to the way that they have subverted the word slave or slavery. According to idioms.thefreedictionary.com slash forward slash slaves plus away, slave away is a verb to work very hard or persistently. I've been slaving away in the garden. The accountant slaved away on the tax returns. So there you get an understanding that in the colloquial use, the original definition of slave is used, meaning simply to work. Now, this is in contrast to the usual definition. According to Wikipedia, slavery is the ownership of a person as property, especially in regards to their labor. So here the person, I guess, who's writing this, if there are, in fact, if there is, it is, in fact, written by a single individual, they are only referencing the original meaning of the word slavery as in a worker versus the, the, the addition of a person being considered property. Slavery typically involves compulsory work with the slave's location of work and residence dictated by the party that holds them in bondage. 
Enslavement is the placement of a person into slavery, and the person is called a slave or an enslaved person. Now, slave is equivalent to worker, except for the fact that slave nowadays carries a much weightier meaning to it than simply calling somebody a worker. But usually when you call someone just a worker or a, um, a unskilled worker or basic entry-level worker, for instance, these are generally speaking derogatory terms that might not be on the same level as slave, but is essentially used in the same manner. Many historical cases of enslavement occurred as a result of breaking the law, becoming indebted, suffering a military defeat, or exploitation for cheap labor. Other forms of slavery were instituted along demographic lines, such as race or sex. Slaves may be kept in bondage for life or fixed for a period of time, after which they would be granted freedom. Although slavery is usually involuntary and involves coercion, there are also cases where people voluntarily enter into slavery to pay a debt or earn money due to poverty. In the course of human history, slavery was a typical feature of civilization and was legal in most societies, but is now outlawed in most countries of the world except as a punishment for a crime. Now that's obviously false considering the word slavery means to work. But when they add the addition of a person being owned as property, in practicality only the word of slavery is outlawed, except it's not outlawed because it's also considered, as it says here, exception for punishment of a crime. So here they like to go around saying slavery was outlawed, or as they say, forced labor and slavery, but it's not. In addition, the idea of viewing someone as equity or property is alive and well today and much worse than it ever was in the past. And we're going to see uh, the tangible examples of this uh, further in the video. Now, of course, they also had to subvert other ideas, and this includes the idea of a plantation. See, they have often this stated mantra that the plantations were worked by slaves, always of a certain skin color. Now, this is a fictional caricature that they used to subvert the original and to ensure that the problem of the war for independence does not happen again. Now, what we live under is the same exact time type of structure that existed at that time that they say that slaves worked the plantations. These were called proprietary colonies, according to Wikipedia. Proprietary colonies were a type of colony in English America which existed during the early modern period. And there, of course, you got a bunch of labels that they're throwing on it to obscure the truth. In English overseas possessions established from the 17th century onwards, all land in the colonies belonged to the crown, which held ultimate authority over their management. All English colonies were divided by the crown via royal charters to one of the three types of colony, proprietary colonies, charter colonies, and crown colonies. Under the proprietary systems, individuals or companies, often joint stock companies known as proprietors, were granted commercial charters by the crown to establish overseas colonies. These proprietors were then granted the authority to select the governors and other officials in the colony. This is exactly what goes on today in the same, in fact, in the much larger region of the entire continental North America, whereas then it was simply relegated to this specific section of the coast. This type of indirect rule eventually fell out of favor in the English colonial empire due to a variety of reasons, including the gradual socio-political stabilization of England's American colonies, the easing of bureaucratic difficulties in managing the colonies, and increasing economic or administrative difficulties faced by proprietors. Successive English sovereigns sought to solidify their power and authority through the empire and gradually confederated all proprietary colonies to crown colonies, which were administered by officials directly appointed by the crown. By the 18th century, most former proprietary colonies had been converted into crown colonies. So basically what they did was they didn't try to resurrect the same, in most, most ways anyway, they didn't resurrect the same thing in... Uh, well, actually, they did resurrect this stuff in the same name, under the same mechanism, and in some cases, even under the same entities. But they lie to us and say that this stuff is in the past, because those particular entities are in the past, but the concepts in reality is the same. Now we get the subversion of the word plantation. Now, it used to be that the word was at plantation, meaning the planting of a colony. In the history of colonialism, a plantation was a form of colonization in which settlers would establish permanent or semi-permanent colonial settlements in a new region. And of course, this is not part of the propaganda machine. 
The term first appeared in the 1580s in the English language to describe the process of colonization before being used to refer to a colony by the 1610s. And of course, they're just stating things without any reference because it doesn't matter if what they say is true or not. What they're doing is spinning a story. By the 1710s, the word was also being used to describe large farms where cash crop goods were produced, typically in tropical regions. The first plantations were established during the Edwardian conquest of Wales and the plantations of Ireland by the English crown. In Wales, King Edward I of England began a policy of constructing a chain of fortifications and castles in North Wales to control the native Welsh population. The Welsh were only permitted to enter the fortifications and castles unarmed during the day and were forbidden from trading. In Ireland, during the Tudor and Stuart eras, the English crown initiated a large-scale colonization of Ireland, in particular the province of Ulster, with Protestant settlers from Great Britain. These plantations led to the de demogra or demography of Ireland becoming permanently altered to create a new Protestant ascendancy, which would dominate Irish society for the next few centuries. Now, the truth of this is not important. They're spinning a story, and this story is done to establish the idea that they ultimately and originally controlled these regions. Thus, that gives them a claim to go and control the area because they say they did it before and they're going to do it now. That's the important part. Now, the other thing, of course, that it does is it subverts the reality of the past and just how strongly it relates to today because they're doing the same stuff they did then. And they lost. So that's what it means when someone says that history is rewritten by the losers to make it look like they won. Now, our next document to explain what I said before about the idea that people are property and that's the way things are done today in, in concept, the way they define slavery is not at all outlawed and therefore slavery has in fact has not been outlawed because that's their definition of it. They simply lie. This is a law dictionary adapted to the constitutional laws of the United States of America and of the several states of the American Union with references to civil and other systems of foreign law by John Bouvier, Volume 2. And this is 1883 Philadelphia J.B. Lippin Cotton Company. And of course, naturally, this would have been after the uh, Treaty of 1871. Here, under on page 21, under Judicial Judicare Acts and Judicial Mortgage these are definitions, of course, mind you. No claim of a sestucu trust against the trustee for property held on an express trust shall be barred by any statute of limitations. A tenant for life shall have no right to commit equitable waste. So, mind you, that's not a freehold. That's a tenant for life. Unless each right is expressly conferred by the instrument creating the estate. That's where, of course, we get our modern word state is the estate, but they're considered different things because it's the version of definitions. There shall be no merger by operation of law, only of any estate, the beneficial interest which would not be deemed merged in equity. A mortgager entitled for the time being to the possession of the profits of land as to which the mortgages shall have given no notice of his intention to take possession may sue for such possession or for the recovery of such profits or to prevent or recover damages in respect of any trespass or other wrong relative thereto in his own name only unless the cause of action arises upon a lease or other contract made jointly with any other person. Now we're all leaseholders, not freeholders of any pro proprietary equity that we might hold. Any absolute assignment of a chose in action of which express notice in writing shall have been given to the debtor shall pass the legal right thereto from the date of notice and all remedies for the name and the power to give a good discharge provided that in if this debtor uh, etc shall have had notice of any conflicting claims to such debt he shall be entitled to call upon such claimants to interplead Mind you, this is not the constitutional law. That's a big thing. This is fraud. This definition here is fraud, but we'll get to the implications of that in just a bit. Stipulations as to time or otherwise, which would not have been deemed they 
essence of construction is formally in equity, a mandamus or an injunction may be granted or a receiver appointed by an interlocutory order, which may be made either unconditionally or on terms, and an injunction may be granted to prevent threatened waste or trespass, whether the estates be legal or equitable, or whether the person against whom the injunction is sought is or is not in possession under any claim of title or sought to be restrained under color of title. In proceedings arising from collisions at sea, where both ships are in fault, the rules here to enforce in the court are admiralty shall prevail. In question relating to the custody of infants, the rules of equity shall prevail. That tells you that they still believe, in fact, that a person is property, a human being is property. That's their very definition of what slavery is. Therefore, it is, in fact, still in force, practically speaking, across the board today, and not as punishment for a crime, unless, of course, you consider the birth of an infant a crime of which the infant has committed, which, of course, they might. So that's what they mean, of course. Now, this is coming from, and this is the current definition used in relation to how children are treated as equity, as property. That can be bought, sold, traded, etc. Slavery, essentially. And all of their lies about the constitutional states of America running an excessive slave trade, as they say, of forced indentured servitude, and that America was, as they say, built on that. This is coming from the same individuals who define any um, conflicts in, in the, as it says here, the custody of infants, the rules of equity shall prevail. Now, who defends their freehold? They are the freeholders. We are not. We are leaseholders of their freehold. Nobody today, other than large conglomerates and the overseas possessions of proprietary chartered governments, i.e. municipal corporations, for one, none of them are held by the people. Constitutional states of America set up the people as the freeholders, whereas in the context of what we live under today, for a foreign oligarchy are the freeholders and we are simply leaseholders granted permission or privilege as they say a right driving is a privilege not a right that's because they're the freeholders and they need defense of their freehold and that's where you find the usa freedom corps was a white house office and fifth policy council along with domestic economic national security and the homeland security in the executive office of the President of the United States under George W. Bush, who as President served as its chair. Bush announced his creation during this 2002 State of the Union address, and the Corps was officially established the next day, 30 January, describing itself as a coordinating council, working to strengthen our culture of service and help find opportunities for every American to start volunteering. The USA Freedom Corps Network, an online clearinghouse, promoted individual volunteer service opportunities within the United States and abroad and connected Americans to opportunities to serve in federal programs such as AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, and Senior Corps, or to find local service opportunities by zip code and interest. The council and office were also involved with U.S. federal government service programs and provided new support for these existing programs. AmeriCorps grew from 50,000 to 75,000 in 2004. Now that 75,000 is an important number right then. The Peace Corps reached its highest levels in more than 30 years. Freedom Corps also created new programs such as Citizen Corps for Homeland Security, Volunteers for Prosperity for International Volunteering, and a President's Council on Service and Civic Participation, which promoted the new President's Volunteer Service Award. So this is how they nicely talk about their, their Freedom Corps that defends their freehold. Let's look at how they talk about the freedom corps that defend the freeholds of the people in which they are not the sole proprietors. See here, as you saw before, they have the USA Freedom Corps. However, if you look up the term Free Corps under Merriam-Webster, you'll find the meaning of Free Corps is a corps of usually German volunteer soldiers. And of course, we'll look at how they elaborate on that. But I expect that you can guess how this is going to go. Free Corps, spelled F-R-E-I-K-O-R-P-S, 
here at Free Corps or Volunteer Corps were irregular German and other European paramilitary volunteer units that existed from the 18th to early 20th centuries. Again, of course, these particular Free Corps have been removed as a problem, or so they say. They effectively fought as mercenaries or private military companies, and here you got the labels being thrown at it, regardless of their own nationality. In German-speaking countries, the first so-called Free Corps, Free Regiments, Frey Regimentaire, those are not the same words, by the way, were formed in the 18th century, and native volunteers, enemy renegades, and deserters. So, of course, throwing words, labels at it to demean it. These sometimes exotically equipped units served as infantry and cavalry. Don't you like that little dig there? Exotically equipped? Ha. Or more rarely as artillery, sometimes in just company strength and sometimes in formations of up to several thousand strong. There were also other various mixed formations or legions. The Prussian von Kleist Free Corps included infantry, Jaeger, dragoons, and hussars. The French Volontaire de Sox combined Uhlans and dragoons. Now, of course, this is an example of the spinning a story, as I said before, to subvert the truth and to avoid the consequences of having a Free Corps not in their control, whereas the USA Freedom Corps well, they talk very differently about that idea, but it's essentially the same idea, which is a core of defenders to defend the freehold. In the aftermath of World War I and during the German Revolution of 1918 to 1919, Free Corps consisted partially of World War I veterans who were raised as paramilitary militias. There they get to obfuscate the word militia, which essentially speaking just means military. They were ostensibly mustered to fight on behalf of the government against the German communists attempting to overthrow the Weimar Republic. However, many Free Corps were largely despised in the Republic and were involved in assassinations of its supporters, later aiding the Nazis in their rise to power. So they usually do this tactic where if you're doing one thing or another, they will always present activities or actions as coming from one side or the other. The idea of duality, either you're communist or you're capitalist. Let's ignore the fact that communists tend to be socialists, including the so-called Nazis were socialists. But as long as you repeat the same lie and spin a story, it doesn't matter what's true or not. It matters whether or not you can avoid the consequence of the same thing happening again and a challenge being done to the very same people that set up the wicked system of the colonial America. Now, the Free Corps, Fry Corps, F-R-I-K-O-R-P-S, Donmark, was a unit of the Waffen-SS during the World War II consisting of volunteers from Denmark. Now notice, of course, these are all volunteers, just like the USA Freedom Corps are volunteers, except that these are volunteers to defend the freehold of the people, whereas the USA Freedom Corps are volunteers to defend the freehold of overseas proprietary lords, or lord proprietors, as we had then and we have today. It was established following an initiative by the National Socialist Workers Party of Denmark, DNSAP, or DNSAP, in the immediate aftermath of the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941 and subsequently endorsed by Denmark's, Denmark's government, which authorized officers of the Royal Danish Army to enlist in the unit, participate in fighting in the Eastern Front, and was disbanded in 1943. During the course of the war, approximately 6,000 Danes joined the Corps, including 77 officers of the Royal Danish Army. Now, of course, they always do this little game. This is spinning a story. You can't know if any of this stuff is actually true, simply that they are leveraging labels or name-calling onto an entity they see as an enemy. And when you see the patterns here, you understand who is running things and what they don't like and what they don't want happening. And that's a unit of free corps, a free guard, if you will, of veterans or citizens specifically to contest them and their control over the territory. And their primary method so far has been effective is the use of information control and the leveraging of labels or name calling. Whether or not the event happened or whether or not these units actually existed is of little consequence. They simply make the caricature and then they throw the caricature at their opponents while they make their own entities, whether or not they were vilified or otherwise, into heroes, and thus they can, essentially speaking, change history and rewrite everything that happened before, and obviously erase the atrocities that they did then so that they can do them, or continue to doing them, to do them today. 
Now, one of the first and most important elements to the constitutional states of America, which had to be removed or subverted, were essentially dealt with. Before the idea of the freedom of speech and before the care bearing of arms, of weapons, the primary thing they had to do away with was the freedom of assembly. When you have freedom of assembly, you can get a group of people together to resist them. So they had to get rid of it, and of course they had to do it under the guise of the Constitution, because if they simply came in and declared that they were going to, to remove freedom of assembly, then essentially they would have had the same issues that the colonial powers, the Lord Proprietors had during the War for Independence. This approach, the main approach that sort of worked to removing the freedom of assembly, actually did not revolve around the idea of assembling, but rather was a roundabout way to target that particular idea. See, that was the motive. The motive was to remove the freedom of assembly, but the target was in fact alcohol. Now, a way to put this into context is that during the colonial period, of which many would refer to pirate republics or merchant republics, most business was done in alehouses, taverns, pubs, whatever you want to call them, but either way, drinking establishments. It wasn't done in the town center, usually. It wasn't done in uh, any boardrooms or anything like that. And this is the idea behind the term political party. Political parties of today, of course, are simply boring events in which people get together and talk about mundane uh, regurgitation of propaganda and don't actually ever do anything. They just sit around and talk. And usually in a very boring and meticulous, uh, uh, not meticulous, but um, tedious setting. Rather than, of course, in a pub, an alehouse, a bar, or things like that. That is, in fact, technically speaking, where everything is still done today, even though we don't recognize it anymore. That's how, wherever they get business done, they go out drinking, they invite you to a party, hence the term political party. So the first example that we can understand of how they've subverted the idea of freedom of assembly in relation to subverting freedom of consumption comes from Tun Tavern, Tun, according to Wikipedia, Tun Tavern was a tavern and brewery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which was a founding or early meeting place for a number of notable groups. It is traditionally regarded as the site where what became the United States Marine Corps held its first recruitment drive during the American Revolution. It is also regarded as one of the birthplaces of Masonic teachings in America. Yeah, that's nice. I like to throw that one in there. Even though the Masons are in fact enemies of the constitutional states of America and the people. The tavern was erected in 1686 at the intersection of King, later called Water Street, and Tun Alley by settler Joshua Carpenter, brother Samuel Carpenter. Here we go, of course, with the story spinning. A Quaker merchant who made a fortune trading in Barbados, and there's all of their labels being thrown at them. Joshua Carpenter was built, Joshua Carpenter built the Tun on the carriageway that led to Carpenter's Wharf. Tun Tavern was named for the old English word tun, meaning a barrel or keg of beer. In the 1740s, a restaurant appellation, Peggy Mullen's Red Hot Beer Steak Club, was added to the name of the tavern. Now, who actually knows whether or not Tun Tavern was even real? Now, I believe that it was fake, and it was a place that didn't exist, because the colonialists, just as today, needed to speak in code because of their overlords that were watching out for any sort of gatherings or freedom or assemblies, just as they do today. They have spies everywhere watching people to ensure that there's no mischief afoot. And of course, they would have other ways of saying it so that it doesn't apparently anyway infringe on the freedom of assembly. But it does, of course. Now, ton likely comes from the word that we use today, which is tonnage or the size of something or, say, the tonnage of a ship. Tun Tavern, uh, the ton, the place for basically merchants to go, etc. But who actually knows? Because the, the everything that they've put here essentially is a lie. And the idea that it was the birthplace of the Marine Corps is probably equally a lie. And they don't ever want you to question those things because they don't want you unraveling their lies, right? Because they would have consequences for that. 
Now, on the other hand, this gives you an understanding of exactly how dr drinking establishments were viewed in the past versus how they're viewed today. They were not originally considered by the people anyway, a gathering for criminals, but nowadays many people consider them a gathering of cr for criminals as the colonial uh, Lord proprietors of the time period and their lofty establishments far in London would have in fact considered taverns as dens of crime, which is the same perspective and viewpoint that they leverage on drinking establishments today. Now this brings us to the idea of a beer garden and beer and drinking establishments are a staple or used to be anyway of so-called German culture, but Beer Garten is, in fact, also the word for a, the Dutch drinking establishment of a beer garden. And according to Wikipedia, a beer garden is an outdoor area in which beer and food are served, typically at shared tables shaded by trees. Beer gardens originated in Bavaria, of which Munich is the capital city in the 19th century and remain common in southern Germany. They are usually attached to a brewery, brewery beer hall, pub, or restaurant, per se, maybe even a tavern. Now I understand what the whole basis to the feminist tar uh, effective targeting of anything that challenges the freehold through essentially propaganda campaigns, usually by men pretending to be women, of course, just like the Prohibition era where they lumped in female voting or so-called women's suffrage in the phony elections that we have today with, of course, the prohibiting of liquor. You see, the liquor or the consumption of alcohol is not actually what they were targeting. Freedom to assemble had to do with the uh, gathering of people together in an unregulated environment. And so in order to target that, they had to regulate the consumption at the areas in which people would gather to talk about such issues where they can regulate the environment where those gatherings are going on. So it had to do with the targeting of the concept of freedom of assembly contained in the Constitution of the States of America, basically. Not the United States of America Corporation, but rather the Constitutional States of America, or CSA. Now we contrast that to the way that they currently have flipped the script to label the idea of gathering and drinking establishments as essentially speaking Nazi or socialist gatherings so that they can target under the guise of the Constitution, in fact, the freedom of assembly. The Beer Hall Push, also known as the Munich Push, was a failed coup d'etat by Nazi party. And here they've got, of course, more crap to spin their lie. Leader Adolf Hitler and Eric Ludendorff with, of course, titles and labels and everything else they do. And other leaders in Munich, Bavaria. Now, of course, none of these people could, it could be that none of these people existed. And this stuff happened in a completely different context. And they're simply lying about it in order to label and target the gathering of people and drinking establishments being a threat to their freehold. And, of course, naturally, the people taking back their freehold. On 8 to 9 November 1923, during the Weimar Republic, approximately 2,000 Nazis marched on the Feldherrn Hall in the city center, but were confronted by a police cordon, which resulted in the deaths of 50 Nazis, four police officers, and one bystander. Hitler escaped immediate arrest and was spirited off to safety in the countryside. After two days, he was arrested and charged with treason. And, of course, they drop any details on that particular tidbit. They just throw in there because they're lying. But this sounds particularly similar to certain events of today. Such as, on January 6, 2021, the United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C. was attacked by a mob of supporters of then-President U.S. Donald Trump, or U.S. President Donald Trump, two months after his defeat in the 2020 presidential election. They sought to keep Trump in power by occupying the Capitol and preventing a joint session of Congress counting the Electoral College votes to formalize the victory of President-elect Joe Biden. The attack was ultimately unsuccessful in preventing the certification of the election results. According to the bipartisan House Select Committee that investigated the incident, the attack was a culmination of a seven-part plan by Trump to overturn the election within 36 hours. Five people died. One was shot by Capitol Police. Another died of drug overdose and three died of natural causes, including a police officer. Many people were injured, including 174 police officers, four officers who responded to the attack died by suicide within seven months. Damage caused by attackers exceeded 2.7 million. 
Now this event, as well as the one we just read, all of them are considered in the same context as the gatherings of colonists during the War for Independence. The same people who sought to rule the colonists with an iron fist are the same people who tried to rule the Europeans with the same thing and the same people who condemn these events today. They see all of these events as equally the same. On the other hand, a lot of people who will laud the forming of the Marine Corps Tun Tavern and of course the events of the War for Independence and the colonists standing up to usurping overlords would equally condemn the events of 1923 and January 6th while supporting the Tun Tavern incident. They do not see all of these things as equal. Our enemies, of course, see these things as equal. But those that would laud Tun Tavern, in fact, are lying. They're just following along with the script, something that's embedded into culture. Because if you believe that Tun Tavern and the forming of the U.S. Marine Corps is lawful and legitimate, then you also will condone the events of January 6th and 1923 with the Beer Hall push. Because what they're doing is they're establishing stories and labels to vilify the very thing that we believe was the most courageous events of the War for Independence. In continuation, a week after the attack, the House of Representatives impeached Trump for incitement of insurrection. Oh, what, is this? what does that sound like? Making him the only U.S. president to be impeached twice. Perhaps impeached, but they did the very same thing to the so-called founding fathers in this 18th century, and the same thing to the people in so-called Nazi Germany. Of course, these are Nazis doing it, because they all come from the same perspective of owning the freehold over the people rather than the people owning the freehold themselves. In February, after Trump had left office, the Senate voted 57 to 40, blah, blah, blah. Now, the rest of this stuff is nonsense. In fact, most of it's nonsense. But the point is that we see a pattern here. And the recognition of that pattern is a way to tangibly understand who the enemy is and to actively target their operations rather than sitting around and arguing with people who have no concept of what's actually going on in the world. Now, the understanding of this actual targeting of the freedom of assembly behind the licensing of liquor and liquor establishments can be found in the Department of Interior Bureau of Education Bulletin number 1918, number 35, or Bulletin number 35 from 1918. Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education, a report of the Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education appointed by the National Education Association, and that's 1918. Now, the first thing we're going to look at in fact, the only thing for the context of this video we need to look at on this page is the health director. This council member should seek to ascertain whether the health needs of the pupils are adequately met. For this purpose, he should consider the ventilation and sanitation of the building, the provisions for lunch, the posture of pupils, the amount of homework required, the provisions for physical training, and the effects of athletes. We should find out whether the pupils are having excessive social activities outside of school and devise means for gaining the cooperation of parents and the proper regulation of work and recreation. He may well see whether the teaching of biology is properly focused upon hygiene and sanitation. The key words here are excessive social activities. As I said before, the right of freedom of assembly is targeted in the school system, and that is what is behind the licensing of liquor. Uh, at the same time, we have the words hygiene and sanitation, which means something very different from what we would normally think, especially considering it states in the first section, the ventilation and sanitation of the building. But their focus is upon hygiene and sanitation, which do, does not have to do with the ventilation of the building, but means something more insidious. Here, document sanitation is the process of cleaning a document to ensure that only the intended information can be accessed from it. In addition to making sure the document text doesn't openly divulge anything it shouldn't, sanitization includes removing metadata that could pose a privacy or security risk. That is what the cardinal principles means by sanitation 
It's sanitizing the environment so that nothing that can target or damage their control is implemented into it and specifically targets the freedom of speech and freedom of press in the Constitution of the United States. But the excessive social activities or freedom to assemble is their primary focus. Document sanitation and sanitizing press and speech comes after. Now the next thing is the word hygiene. Since the, this is from Britannica. Since the founding of the United Nations, the concepts of mental health and hygiene have achieved international acceptance, as defined in the 1946 Constitution of the World Health Organization, WHO. Now you understand what their constitutional states of America, or the United States of America, what their constitution is they reference, that is in fact the UN Constitution from 1946. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, so brainwashing. The term mental health represents a variety of human aspirations, rehabilitation for mental illness, blah, blah, blah. So that's what they mean by hygiene. That's mental hygiene. Control of what people are thinking, feeling, or what is involved in their mental state. And that it requ requires sanitation of the environment so that nothing can damage the mental state of their controlled equity. That is how they see human beings. Now, also in the cardinal principles of secondary education, we find this idea of worthy use of leisure. And that's what has to do with controlling, uh, essentially, the right to peaceably assemble or, as they term it, excessive social activities. Aside from the immediate discharge of these specific duties, every individual should have a margin of time for the cultivation of personal and social interests. This leisure, if worthily used, will recreate his powers and enlarge and enrich life, thereby making him better able to meet his responsibilities. Now, again, these are all about how having to damage and to subvert and to usurp the legitimate constitution of the states of america what we now call the united constitution of the united states of america and the primary one of that is of course the unworthy use of leisure impairs health right this is mental health this is not what you would think of as corporeal health because they actually want you to be in a state of health that's controlled disrupts home life lessens vocational efficiency and destroys civic mindedness the tendency in industrial life aided by legislation is to decrease the working hours of large groups of people, while shortened hours tend to lessen the harmful reactions that arise from prolonged strain, they increase if possible the importance of preparation for leisure in view of these considerations. Education for the worthy use of leisure is of increasing importance as an objective. And of course, this is spoken with a, what someone would call a forked tongue, uh, slimy words, where basically what they're saying is designed to make you think that what they're talking about relates to your physical overall uh, health, uh, d good, healthy habits, you know, having a nice, peaceful environment, but that's not what they mean. What they mean is to usurp the U.S. Constitution of the law of the land so that they can control the freehold and the human equity that they see as their property. Now, another sanitization technique is, is targeted at the effective ability to defend oneself and the freehold. And their primary focus is, of course, going to be on martial arts. Hence the term martial arts, martial being fighting, just as martial law is ruled by force. That's what martial law means. It means I say what goes, and if you disagree, I will kill you. That's martial law. It's ruled by force. And the right to keep and bear arms does not relate to simply firearms, but the overall capability of an individual to fight and defend oneself. And that's what martial arts has to do with it. Now, the sanitization of that we find today in so -called, the so-called Ultimate Fighting Championship and the restrictive control over mixed martial arts, as well as, essentially speaking, every other martial art control structure, all based around licensing, just like liquor licensing is to do to remove the freedom of assembly, so sanitization of martial arts is to remove the freedom to keep and bear arms. And literally, I suppose, in this context, it would re relate to arms of the human appendage. Now, today, it's undeniable that men fight as women in the 
UFC, Mixed Martial Arts Program, whatever you want to call it, with the in, uh, induction of the so-called transgender fighter of uh, Fallon Fox, something like that. Now, what the benefit of this does is it gives us an undeniable claim that men are fighting in the women's division, essentially, of the UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship. It also gives us a male frame to compare to other fighters in UFC, and I'm sure some know where I'm going with this. Now, a male frame on a body, the human body, has a very specific indicators that show its difference from a woman's body. And as we saw before, that transgender individual has the same male frame, being, of course, quote-unquote, born a male, that any other masculine individual would have. And one of those is the structure of the torso, essentially speaking, creating a V towards the southern region. And the frame itself is not capable, it not, it, no one is capable of changing their skeletal structure, the frame of their body. No matter what surgeries, chemicals, or anything else they put into it, they cannot change the structural frame itself. And then we have the transgender fighter, the person born male. And we see that frame matches exactly perfectly to a male frame. And we can take that and then compare it to other alleged female fighters in the UFC. Ronda Rousey is one such wildly lauded and, and before the induction of Fallon Fox into the UFC was the UFC Ultimate Fighting Women's Champion for a long time, is a man. And you can see it from the frame exactly matches that of any transgender individual born a male. Possibly speaking, none of them have actually quote unquote transitioned. But either way, you see the male frame, you see the V-shape that goes down the torso. No female human on the planet who has ever born a female will have that. That is a singular masculine trait when it comes to a frame. And Ronda Rousey has never been considered anything but a woman when in fact that individual is a man. Now, the kickbox alleged kickboxing female kickboxing champion who apparently knocked out ronda rousey in a couple seconds named holly home is also a man when you compare the frame of holly home when you compare the frame of ronda rousey and when you compare the frame of fallon fox you find equally the same exact traits on torso shoulders the face everything it is all male all of them are men None of them are women, and the joke, of course, being that Ronda Rousey and Holly Holm equally have been female champions of the UFC. So this leads into a anecdote from my own personal experience. See, I went out to Buffalo Wild Wings with a group of friends to watch the Holly Holm-Ronda Rousey fight, and that's why I specifically bring it up. Now, at the time... I knew that Ronda Rousey was going to lose. Of course, I didn't know just how fake and rigged the whole thing really was. And that they were men fighting, not women. But I knew that Ronda Rousey wasn't going to win. And all my friends were convinced that she was going to win just because she was so popular and everything else. And I said, she couldn't fight standing up. There's no way she's going to win. Of course, the whole thing is a play act. And so I was so certain that I made a bet with them that I'd walk home if I was wrong. And they didn't have any downside to losing the bet either. But either way, I was right and they were wrong. But the whole episode, I didn't know at the time the true significance of just how fake these things are and the implications that individuals train their entire lives and devote everything to becoming a champion for an event of which they have no hope ever of achieving and not just because they have their certain favorites that are picked by corporations and companies and groups and whatnot but because the individuals that go up and do these fights are in fact like basically speaking actors just like any stunt double on a movie the only way that you can get to those positions if you're essentially a liar 
because no actual martial artist who trains their entire life to fight at these championships is ever going to reach the uh, they, they're never going to reach the level of which they can fight at these entirely and completely fake championships in which you have essentially male stunt actors playing women now another thing to mention as far as my personal experience in the martial arts field goes is this concept of saving face according to cambridge dictionary it states to keep your reputation and avoid others losing respect for you we said he left to pursue other interests to let him save face but actually we fired him now that's a very nasty and uh contemptuous definition example there however this idea of saving face is well known as essentially a nice way to say someone lied and when i was in california <clears throat> i spent a great deal of time acquiring a fighting license so that i could enter amateur championships in order to essentially start my mixed martial arts career because as far as the way that they structure it is you have to start amateur and then you go professional which instead of having to do with payment actually has to do in far as far as they term it with protection protective equipment when you fight in the amateur levels you have different protections to avoid injury when you fight professional those protections are gone such as shin pads however i realized it was going to be a waste of time because both of the individuals that i was to fight backed out now both of those people would say something like i didn't want to fight you because i was afraid i might kill you that is what's called saving face now there's a general misunderstanding or a lack of uh of reality in relation to this idea of actions versus words when somebody takes the action of running away they're showing cowardice and then they use words to try to cover that up the idea of saving face is lying and is in fact cowardice so they attempt to essentially add a bunch of words to make cowardice not what it is because the word cowardice of course still has embedded bad connotations in the culture and in definitions that are used by the culture in practice rather than the definitions imposed on the culture through institutional controls like the school system like the phony government like corporations and other such entities so this is something that i'm sure a lot of people discover in life is that the person generally speaking who's the coward is lauded as the best one and as being a paragon of good because they do things not for the sake of glory but for the sake of good for good itself of course these are mantras and things that don't have anything to do with the reality and the reality is that those that control the freehold do not want uprisings to happen against them and the freehold taken away from their hands and put in the hands of someone else say the people who are in that realm or that region that area and one of the ways they need to do this is through mental hygiene and sanitization and that's why without a doubt you see cowardice lauded over courage today but they are liars and they always find a way to say that what you see happening is not actually what you see happening and that's of course behind the concept of saving face now also while i had a long career in martial arts but not a career essentially where i was paid but in the idea of a career of training and practice i also equally had a very long experienced story personal story and experience in politics specifically while i was in high school i started volunteering in a group called the lazy fair syndicate and i've been essentially around the block when it comes to such things now while i was attending the uh, ohio state university in 2019 i volunteered on the so-called trump campaign and there i witnessed many things that i have seen before in all of my 
experiences as far as pol political things go. And like I said before, political party used to be an actual party, but instead got turned into the abhorrent abomination that it is today. Designed, of course, to sanitize and remove the element of excess of social activities. Because nobody ever wants to go to political rallies or political parties today because they're not really parties. They're boring, awful, mundane elements. And when Trump came up in 2016, he started to change those things into actual parties again. People would go and watch things while drinking and laughing and making jokes and having a good time. That's what it's supposed to be like. Of course, they changed that, but... A lot of the changing of that required an immense amount of effort from the individuals involved down to the what they um, contemptuously like to call the grassroots level. One of the main important elements that I encountered while being on the Trump campaign was that the re actual recruiting process took place at restaurants, or rather, drinking establishments with a liquor license that serve food. Does that sound like any certain types of places that we read about previously? Now at this, if you want to call it a dinner, even though alcohol is naturally going to be involved, there were three characters there that were doing the recruiting. There was a very obese, overweight guy who apparently worked in Governor Kasich's office and um, Governor Kasich was a particular piece of work, apparently, but I believe fictional character played by an actor, to some extent, anyway, just a, a minion with a false name. Now, this guy worked in his office and was very blustery and bogus. He was definitely not a quote-unquote Trump supporter. Now, the woman who was there, she was a little bit overweight as well, and she said that they that our job as being recruited, of which there were three of us, was to flush out Trump supporters as if you were trying to decipher the location of an enemy agent. That is the way that she termed it. And the other guy that was there was an attorney whose dream it was to go to Washington, D.C. And these are the individuals running the Trump campaign. So that should tell you all you need to know as far as the subversion of the character that is Trump should go. The political parties of 2016 versus the creepy, mundane, and tedious shows that we see today. And this, of course, happened at a drinking establishment. Now, two of the people there, uh, other than myself, were college, were high school age, college age, whatever you want to call them, teenagers. And, of course, I was the only one that was being recruited who had any level of experience. Naturally, later, the overweight, obese guy called me all the names you would imagine, including Nazi. That does not sound like what you would consider a Trump supporter to do, considering they're being labeled that today. But that's the way this guy was. He freaked out, and that was simply because I was talking about a topic he didn't like, such as the Prussian military. But this is exactly how you can determine whether or not somebody is a member of the enemy organization, because they will always throw out labels when you start treading on territory that's forbidden because that is the tactic they have always used and will continue to be the tactic that they use whether it works or not. Now in addition to the skeevy recruiting element that seems similar to some other things we looked at, despite the fact that these people were doing it for uh, under a false cover uh, for other purposes, there are other things that were done at that time, which I had seen go on before, but not necessarily to that level. See, we had Trump volunteers that would go out there, hardworking people on their time off who were doing something, but they were tricked. There was a bait and switch that went on, where in actuality, the people were going out to volunteer for individuals and elements they had never heard of nor cared about, including uh, judges for race, and thus they leveraged the the volunteer group, right? Remember that word volunteer from the Free Corps? The volunteer group they leveraged to do something they had not signed up for. And thus they started losing volunteers because they were doing that. And I have seen the same tactic reflected over and over and over again. All they do is change the name, but the character never changes. They always do the same thing. It's a bait and switch. 
and they they did it ever since the colonial period, and they're doing it today. They essentially speaking switched the rebels, the wild colonials of that time period, with the slave holding what so-called white supremacist nationalists of the civil war which then of course they leveraged into the term nazi and so on and so forth they will always do that because they are the ones with the bad character and so they have to claim that their opposition in fact is and of course blame them for all their own crimes and all the things that they actually do including of course lying and cowardice now something else that relates to this idea of mental hygiene and sanitation but the ultimate objective, essentially, of either we own it or we'll destroy it comes from a video game called Watch Dogs Legion, in which they have a group called Zero Day, according to the fandom.com, watchdogs.fandom.com. Zero Day is a terrorist and hacker group in direct competition with the prominent hacker group DeadSec, and is accredited with framing DeadSec for the terrorist attack. It is believed by some that Zero Day are actually rogue SERS agents seeking to destabilize the nation. However, if you play the game to the end, you'll find out that, in fact, the leader of the Dead Set group is Zero Day. And what happens is you have this woman, apparently rogue anyway, who uses a group of ignorant people, freedom fighters, who think that they're doing good, to actually acquire a body of weapons that can then be wielded and turned against the very people that provided such uh, elements. And we're going to find, just as with all this other stuff, parallels in the reality of today. First, we're going to start with something called a Debian repository. A Debian repository is a set of Debian binary source packages organized in a special directory tree and with various infrastructure files, checksums, indices, signatures, descriptions, translations added. Client computers can connect to the repository to download and install packages using an apt-based package management tool. Now, the implications here for this, because a lot of those words are difficult to follow because it's quote-unquote jargon, the implications here is that you have a bunch of people under false pretense who essentially form software packages together. They, they write code, they, they make programs out there, and then they compile, compile these into a database that then can be put into a master computer program to use all of these things. They are building exactly what was designed in that video game, which are a collection of weapons that can then be wielded by somebody else and who which are collected together under false pretense. That's the idea here. And that is how you understand just how such a small group of tyrants have been so effective at taking things over it's because they have had the weapons acquired for them by individuals under false pretense when in fact those individuals have been arming the very entity that they believe they are in competition or fighting against. Now some elements about another entity called Tails, which is a computer program that is operated off of USB. Some things about their website that point to who they actually are and how it relates to the cardinal principles can be found under the heading community health team. Now this is a, a organization that leverages the Debian repository. Here, it says the primary task, help improve the health of the community by caring for the emotional and social sustainability of the project on the long term. That sounds, that's the exact same wording that we find in the Cardinal Principles. The team has a reproductive scope, is auxiliary to the TAILS project, and can be assigned to tasks by the project. The scope of activities presented here is wide and exceeds the current capacity of the team. Listic activities should thus be mapped to concrete goals and prioritized according to the project's needs. Fundamental organization relationships, the group writes to the mailing list of the General Assembly. Now, isn't that nice that they character them, characterize themselves the General Assembly? And can promote activities about diversity, inclusion, feminism, feminism, census method, etc. Of course, feminism has been a long-used catalyst to invoke a different character to the same old tyranny that we see along the lines and of course was the mechanisms behind the so-called prohibition era the team meets the tails board to speak about issues or conflicts reports the team can be contacted by the tails board or by the general assembly or by single people inside of tails to address some issues so isn't that nice the tails board is over the general assembly and the general assembly is over a quote-unquote single people 
External relations answer COC reports when used as a point of contact. Necessary useful skills and competences, English spoken and written, mediation and facilitation skills, possibility of evaluation of different points of view. Isn't that nice? They include that in there. Study active listening, stay up to date with feminism and developing of social justice. And that, of course, tells you exactly what the perspective here is. And, of course, here they have, as always, the control of speech. Be careful in the words that you choose. Be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other participants. Harassment and other exclusionary behavior are unacceptable. This includes, but is not limited to. And, of course, this is lying. This is the intent of sanitizing or the mental hygiene of the cardinal principles to in fact remove the implications of what the Constitution established in the first place which is the freedom of speech the freedom of press and the freedom of assembly and the right to keep and bear arms now the overall mission here as far as it relates to the freehold and the protection of their freehold against all of us, mind you. That includes, essentially speaking, every human being across the planet. This can be found in the 1917 or Pio Benedictine Code of Canon Law in English translation with extensive scholarly apparatus forwarded by Most Reverend John J. Myers, STL, JD, JCD. Dr. Edward N. Peters, curator, Ignatius Press, San Francisco, and this is copyright 2001. Here, under Canon 5, 1983, it states, Customs presently in force, whether universal or particular, but against the prescriptions of these canons, if they are indeed expressly reprobated, are to be corrected as a corruption of the law, even if they are immemorial, nor are they permitted to revive in the future, other customs clearly centenary or immemorial can be tolerated if ordinaries determine that, due to circumstances of person or place, they cannot prudently they cannot be prudently removed. Other customs are considered suppressed unless the code expressly provides otherwise. That is the Universal Church's declaration of war on every legitimate law that has ever existed besides theirs, which is of course naturally not legitimate. Now, this next portion of the video is going to be talking about the concept of the drug trade and how it's essentially speaking leveraged by the same individuals that license liquors um, under the guise of liquors, of course, being bad for your health. Of course, it's bad for their health and it's bad for their definition of mental hygiene and having a sanitized environment. At least the consumption isn't, but the control over the uh, drinking establishments and uh, peaceable assembly, of course, is. And then also this imposed by the same people that say that the slavery and the definition of possessing another human being is outlawed while they consider children to be equity. So there's a variety of places referred to as heroin highway. However, when you Google the saying heroin highway, that, that label, we first start with the main hit, which is Chicago. Learn how the Eisenhower Expressway has become a major route for transporting and selling heroin. In Chicago and the Midwest, find out how the heroin highway affects the community, the crime rate, and recovery options for people struggling with addiction. Now, this phrase heroin highway pops up in a lot of areas, especially in in so-called news outlets where they love to use this tagline a lot possibly for well most definitely for coded messaging but possibly for other purposes as well this states Jan or John Lewandowski chair of the standard select board said Monday afternoon that he had been away recently and learned of the raid in a phone call from a reporter I'm happy to hear that he said upon hearing the news adding that he was aware that it has been referred to as the heroin highway. Lewandowski said the property has been the subject of many complaints from neighbors, particularly regarding the large amount of traffic in and out of it. He said for about a year, the town has brought complaints to Vermont State Police. So this is in Vermont, and this is referencing a property, allegedly, anyway. But there's other possible coded messages here. We're not attempting to decipher those, just simply get an understanding for the repetition of that phrase heroin highway and how it's used in many circumstances next we have uh, this from 
WHIO TV7. US 35 got the name Heroin Highway when people started overdosing in cars and businesses. Deputies said they would go to Dayton to buy drugs. But on their way home on US 35, they would stop to get high before they got back home, putting innocent lives at risk. For a little over three months, deputies have been targeting the highway and they say they stepped up surveillance, it's making a big difference. We're going to keep doing what we're doing because we don't want it here, said Deputy Moore. We want to help those people involved, but at the same time, we want to make sure our community is a safe place for everyone. Yeah. That's, of course, called doublespeak. What's well, referred to usually, anyway, as doublespeak, the forked tongue, the saying one thing but meaning something else. Now, the idea of surveillance and using drug habits as a way to induce heavier surveillance is, of course, that's one of the oldest methods in the playbook, where a situation that you're making you leverage as a pretext to increase further control, of course. Naturally, with all of these the main question, of course, would be with all of these heavy surveillance, heavy handed tactics and all of these things that they do, why has the so-called drug trade not diminished? In fact, it's boomed, if nothing else. Perhaps even far more than anyone might even argue about the alcohol trade during so-called prohibition, even though that whole situation is mostly made up. Also, I remember seeing uh, in a rest stop along one of the routes in Ohio, a sign that said to report individuals that were standing around taking pictures or any other suspicious behavior that involved surveillance. Well, that's kind of odd. See, it used to be that see something, say something would mean when you see somebody, say, doing something suspicious in a parking lot, like two cars pulling up and two people doing some sort of deal, well, that's, you know, the iconic drug deal going down, and that's what do some, see something, say something is. Not somebody's walking around the park on their phone taking pictures of things. That's a little bit odd that they would have a sign like that. Of course, if you think about it, that would be imply, or that would, the logical conclusion there is that Considering the fact that they have cameras, that their cameras would be the anonymous tipster that um, gave them the excuse to come out and harass people who are on their phones. But one has to wonder, of course, what they don't want people taking pictures of, what they don't want people surveilling. That's the big question, and that's the question we're going to answer in this section of the video. So this from WKBN, First News 27, Columbus, Ohio. Two busts involving drugs and cash on Interstate 70 have become some of the largest in state history, Ohio Attorney General David Yost said Thursday. This first happened on August 3rd in Madison County near Columbus. Agents with the Central Ohio Organized Crime Investigations Commission, OOCIC, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, HIDTA, Major Drug Interdiction Task Force, and troopers with the Ohio State Highway Patrol stopped a commercial vehicle. They found 300 pounds of methamphetamine, 17.6 pounds of cocaine, and 30 pounds of marijuana, according to the Attorney General. The contraband has an approximate street value of $14.6 million. Another bust on August 6 led to the discovery of over 935,000 cash, the Attorney General said. Now, of course, the implications here is that they knew where these things were, and this is not exactly a bust, as we would think, but rather startup capital for their own private drug empire. Now, here's another one with uh, Route 33, U.S. Route 33, Ohio's Heroin Highway. Route 33 in southeastern Ohio is part of a statewide effort to stop drug traffickers. And that, of course, is the cover story for their in fact, law enforcement run drug uh, trade trafficking operation. Now, our first element that links the so-called law enforcement to, in fact, over drug trafficking activities comes out of Hocking County, Ohio, off of the U.S. Route 33. A former chief deputy with the Hawking County Sheriff's Office has been indicted on seven additional charges following his previous indictments last year, according to court records. 
Documents from the Hawking County Clerk's Office state that Caleb Moritz was indicted on two counts of corrupting another with drugs, one count of tampering with evidence, two counts of unlawful transactions and weapons, one count of forgery, and one count of theft. All seven counts are felonies. Now, this is a classic example of setting, settling the matter with an underling so that the entire organized conspiracy is uh, let go, as it were. So that way, when somebody comes along and they start talking about, say, so-called law enforcement involved in drug trafficking operations, then the, another person, uh, the critical thinker naysayer, as it were, will come along and say, oh, I heard about that case. I heard that that person, certain so-and-so, got indicted on all that stuff, and thus that ends this conversation there. It's the idea of a phony settlement which we see a lot today with all of these phony settlements, class action lawsuits, where no actual justice is ever done. Now, the other element to this, other than the phony law enforcement, is the cardinal principles and the health director as part of the health department structure. Now, the whole idea of mental hygiene and sanitization of the environment also comes down to this drug trade empire through the control of the outlet as it were the health department prevents the perfect cover for any kind of drug enterprise so here in um, Hawking County we find out that the total property tax uh, the percentage find 54.4 percent goes to the school district 11.5 percent goes to the corporation that would be the municipal City of Logan, the seat of Hawking County. 9.5% to the Hawking County, or to the county. And then 7.6% is developmental disabilities, below that's EMS. Then we have juvenile services. The mental health is one section, and the health department is another. So here we three, see three entities, developmental disabilities, mental health, and health department, that all specifically correlate to drugs. Now, when we look up tax levies, we find out mental health, developmental, Department of Developmental Disabilities, Medical Services, Logan Hawking Health, and, well, and the county. But either way, Developmental Disabilities did four levies, Medical Service did four levies, Mental Health two. So they are, of course, the majority running tax levies. In addition, we, of course, have the uh, Logan Hawking County and the Juvenile Services, as well as the Logan Corporation, making um, tax levies. But the most recent and the most obvious, of course, relate to the Health Department. So to tie this in, we have a um, City Council meeting in which it states, Wendy Hannes. Hannes works for the Hawking County Health Department and wanted to thank council for all the work to create a full-time code enforcement Mama. officer position. What? Now, the idea of the enforcing of codes Mama. is a whole other matter, but the health department's work behind the scenes, as it were, relates to this drug trafficking scheme in the area, which in fact is not only condoned, but actually run by the sheriffs in the region. And this, of course, is not relegated to simply one region, but is, in fact, across the board, an issue that we face today. And it will never get fixed until the phony law enforcement is actually dealt with. Because they are, in fact, running the drug cartel empire that we have to deal with today. Also, from the same report, an ordinance amending ordinance number 14, 2013, to make the code enforcement officer position a full-time position and repealing parts of the ordinance inconsistent therewith. Driscoll moved to pass the ordinance, which was seconded by Chapman. After roll call vote, the motion passed. All voting, yay. Now, this is the minutes from the Logan City Council regular meeting in City Council Chambers, 7 p.m. September 24th. 2019.
Now, at the roll call, it states President Shirley Chapman, David Driscoll, Sean North. That Sean North name is the one to notice. By the way, all voted yay for the health department, and the health department director thanked the council for all their work in uh, establishing a full-time code enforcement officer position. This is the Facebook page for the alleged Sean North. Here, it's highlighting the Hawking Hills Chamber of Commerce, and that boarded up windows is a statement about progress and the transformation happening in Hawking County. And if anybody's been around in 2020, okay. this is representative of the boarding up buildings in large cities across the country. Yeah. Now, the Hawking County Sheriff's Office is run by Sheriff Lonnie E. Yeah. North. What a coincidence. And, of course, I'm using the coincidence in the way that it's supposed to be used, which is something that coincides with something else. Now, here's another individual, Paul Patrick, who looks kind of similar to that Sean North individual. According to his Facebook page, he works at Southern Hope Recovery, LLC. Now, if you look up the uh, business filing for Southern Hope Recovery Center, LLC, we find an individual named Lisa Ross at 148 Elizabeth Street, Proctorville, Ohio. Then, for the same entity, Lisa Ross is then changed to Thomas J. Johnson of 647 North 4th Street, Ironton, Ohio. Next, Thomas J. Johnson changes to Cheryl Hampton of 1420 South 4th Street, Ironton, Ohio. Now, if you look up the name Lisa Ross, under the organi uh, search by organizer or incorporation name, incorporator name, from the business records search, you'll find that the entity listed as Southern Hope uh, Recovery Center, or whatever it was, is not among the documents listed here. Now, Paul Patrick, uh, according to the Facebook page, highlighted an event called Hawking County Overdose Awareness 2024 at Worthington Park in Logan, Ohio. Connect with social service providers and gather with community members in memory of loved ones we have lost to drug overdose. That sounds like a perfect place to, in fact, sell drugs. And, of course, I'm talking in this case about street drugs, not necessarily the pharmaceuticals that are peddled out like, well, like candy. Here it states, Logan, to give back what was given to me feels like an uh, apt theme from Wednesday's Overdose Awareness Day, an event where covering addicts took center stage to share their struggles and the strides they've made to help their peers to get on the right path forward. That was a quote from Cassie, four and a half years clean, who told a story about a sizable crowd of county officials, people in recovery, and others who had been affected by the opioid epidemic. She now works for the OVP Health Recovery Center in Lawrence County, offering the services she once relied on to get sober. OVP was... Only one of the many providers was standing the heat Wednesday to offer resources to those in need. Others included the 317 board, one of the event organizers, Southern Hope Recovery Center, also from Lawrence County. So that's interesting. This this place, Southern Hope Recovery Center, is all over the map with which location it's from. Hawking County Health Department, what a surprise there. Path Behavioral Health, yeah. And uh, what was one of the other uh, levies for taxes exactly? TASC of Southeastern Ohio, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, Tri-County Career Center, Health Recovery Services, and Project Noel. We are here not just to mourn those we've lost to drug addiction, but to celebrate the people that are living and fighting every day, fighting to maintain their sobriety, said Jeffrey Patrick, one of the multiple recovering addicts, to take the mic. And the rest of this is basically just mindless garbage. But... We also find that both Municipal Judge Fred Moses and Common Pleas Judge Jason Despatoric spoke on Wednesday and both spoke on the importance of dual diagnosis to treat substance abuse alongside mental health disorders and understand addiction as a disease, not a matter of personal choice. Sounds like somebody who's involved in the drug trade. So this reminds me of a quote from a particularly uh, irritating movie called Men Who Stare at Goats. Here it states, Bob Wilton, don't eat the eggs, we put LSD in the eggs. Bill Django, and the water, I put LSD in the main water tank. Bob Wilton, what? But we drank the water. Bill Django, yeah. Also, from this movie, 
Larry Hooper, Lieutenant Colonel Django, used funds from the project's black budget to procure prostitutes. Bill Django, that's a lie. Larry Hooper, and to get drugs for himself and his men. Bill Django, that, well, the hooker thing is definitely a lie. And those two quotes perfectly capture the situation that is not just affecting that one example in Logan, Ohio, but in fact the entire country, in which you do in fact have the phony law enforcement, which are in fact foreign occupational forces, running a drug empire right in front of everybody or under everyone's nose. And they're doing it through all of the health, so-called health mechanisms, health department, developmental disabilities, etc. Now, there's another entity in the same place called Cocoa Services, run by somebody, by a family with the last name Cole. Now, I did a movie or video previously about the last name Cole and their implications in the child trafficking, global child trafficking network, which uh, passes through Puebla, Mexico. Now, this particular entity is involved in a great deal of construction in the city of Logan. Now, if you go to their website, it's simply a WordPress website which has not been filled out with any information. In fact, it is still listed on the sample page. If you go to business filings, we have a Coco LLC, which apparently is intended to exist for 99 years. That's a little bit weird and was formed in 2019 and has no description for its purpose. Next, we have Colco Incorporated out of Cincinnati, Ohio, Hamilton County, 3960 Edwards Road, which lists as its services to provide washing and drying services to the public. Well, I don't think they could have been any more obvious with what their purpose is there. Next, there's this weird one, the Ohio Company, as a form of an applicant or name of an applicant for trade name registration, Cole Cole and Company. By the way, this is COLCO. All of these are. And this is 155 East Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio. And under the purpose, it states street name, comma, securities firm. So that's a little bit odd. And the business at this point, or this filing anyway, had been in operation for 20 years, allegedly. Now you have this other filing, which is particularly difficult to read and old, but it states Coco and Company is the name of the applicant. And this is a, a application for um, a trade name for the Ohio Company, to do business as the Ohio Company. So... If that's not confusing, you have a document out of Franklin County, uh, Columbus, in which a company called Coco and Company is filing for the trade name of the Ohio Company. And then you have a different document in which a company called the Ohio Company is filing for the trade name of Coco and Co. Sort of like a uh, revolving door with no end. Now we have the Ohio Company. Uh, is a name being registered by the new Ohio company, LLC, and here it finally states real estate and land development and for any purpose or purpose for which individuals lawfully may associate themselves under blah, 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 the Ohio Revised Code. And this is 141 South High Street, Suite 3500, Columbus, Ohio. So there's the first document in this whole chain of documents that you actually have any relation to construction. The construction of that alleged entity previously with no actual website, Colco Services.